as I have uh, told several of you privately, when you get too old to learn new things, it's time to put you in a grave. <laughs> and uh, by God's grace, I have good health, and so I'm not planning on going to the grave right away. He could always change that, of course, but uh, I'm glad that you are willing to receive perspectives from an old man, and I think probably I have it on just about everybody here in age. I uh, don't want to brag about that, but uh, <laughs> it uh, God has been good to me, and uh, we will have... Uh, occasion to reminisce a little bit, but actually my focus is on the future. I don't like to focus on the past that much. Try to learn as new things come up. Uh, we do live in an age of evangelical drifting. I don't think there's any disagreement among us on that particular fact. I remember when I was president of the Evangelical Theological Society back in 1990. I uh, had the privilege before that of organizing the program the year before, 1989. It was one of the first years that we had been on the West Coast. Generally, the attendance was down. When we, therefore, the meeting is on the West Coast because of travel difficulties. But the, uh, that particular year, we had a, a record enrollment for the annual meeting of evangelicals, something over 300. Now the annual attendance is running easily over 2,000 every year. And uh, so evangelicalism has grown in quality. On the surface, we have a tendency to rejoice in the fact that God is increasing the ranks of evangelicalism. But when you look a little more, a little closer, you see that uh, though we have grown in quantity, we have not grown in quality. And largely it is because there is an, a, a drift carrying on among evangelicals. If you read the book, you saw the long quotation I have from David Wells, who laments, well, first of all, he rejoices in the fact that evangelicalism was a purity and from uh, the 1940s to the middle 1970s, and uh, which incidentally were the first years of my Christian life. But then he laments what has happened uh, beginning in 1970 or 1976 when we elected a born-again president in this country and evangelicalism began to be a majority movement. And now it is not too uncommon to find evangelicals on the front page of your daily newspaper or featured on your newscast on television. And uh, the sad fact is that that growth has not been pure. And uh, the same thing has happened in the field of hermeneutics, that there has been a growing impurity among evangelicals in regard to impurity in, in regard to hermeneutics, and we will dwell upon that a little bit this morning. To set the tone for our discussion, I'd like you to join me in reading... 2 Timothy 2, verses 14 through 19. 2 Timothy 2, 14. Remind them of these things, and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, 
the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Paul was warning Timothy about a similar type of drift in his day. And he presents a remedy to Timothy. We would like to just touch on two points of that remedy today. The goal of this remedy in 2 Timothy 2.15 is to not to attack the problem directly. Be diligent to show yourself to be an approved workman correctly dividing the word of truth. Paul says, use indirect means to remedy the drift. Don't limit yourself to confronting these men directly, though that sometimes may be necessary. 2 Timothy 2, uh, 4.2b says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. So, the direct confrontation is at times necessary. Rather, your goal is to gain the approval of God by making yourself an unashamed workman. Concentrate on the positive side of teaching the word of truth. You are to be a God-pleaser, not a man-pleaser. You are not to allow yourself to be distracted by mere human considerations. You are to have an eye that is single toward his will and glory. You are looking for his seal of approval. Strive to maintain his standards so that you have nothing to be ashamed of before him. Now that word for document, the word for approved, has two ideas. It has the idea of being tested, and it also has the idea of being approved after testing. Now you folk are leaders in the evangelical world and you have more opportunity than anybody else to be tested and to demonstrate your approval before God. It is a great privilege to be tested. It is a great privilege. How are we going to respond to that test? You should have as your goal not to be ashamed because you have done a shoddy job at interpreting the text. Nor should be ashamed of your work before men. Note Paul's elaborating on this theme. He speaks about shame in first, 2 Timothy 1 verses 8, 12, and 16. Timothy needed to hold his head high so that he was not ashamed. Do the right kind of job, and you will not have to apologize to anyone. That's the goal. But the means by which we are to do it is wrapped up in that participle ortha tamunta, correctly interpreting or directly handling the word of truth. Timothy can set the standard by cutting straight the word of truth, or handling the word of truth accurately. We can't be sure why Paul chose this figure. It's possibly because in secular Greek writings it referred to a mason who was squaring and cutting stone to fit exactly into a certain opening. It was used other times to refer to a farmer's plowing a straight furrow in his field or to a tent maker cutting just the right size of a piece of canvas to finish his tent. But it was also used to refer to a road maker constructing a straight road. And uh, I personally lean toward that last meaning because in Proverbs 3 verses 6 and uh, 11 verse 5, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It's essentially the same word in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. In verse 11, 11 5, if the righteousness of the blameless keeps their ways straight, same word using the idea of a straight path. 
And a cognate of this word is used in Hebrews 12:13. Make straight paths for your feet. Paul probably had in mind a figure of road construction, and they had to be exactly right. Now, one summer, while I was in seminary, I worked for the the uh, highway department in the state of Georgia to try to keep ends in together. And uh, I worked for the, I was assigned to the engineering department in, in the field. We were putting together the South Freeway from downtown Atlanta uh, to the south there. And uh, my job was to figure dirt quantities for the landfills and all that kind of stuff. And it got kind of technical. And at one point, I goofed up, and we had a telephone pole right in the middle of the southbound lane. <laughs> that was kind of a tragedy. <laughs> but thankfully, my superior caught it before it was too late. Uh, we have to construct the road of truth without a flaw, brothers and sisters. Now, some have objected to trying to understand what, Paul fig what figure Paul had in mind. All they need to say all we have to do is to be in the same ballpark as Paul. Well, I frankly have had it with ballpark exegesis. <laughs> they claim that knowing the broad sense of the word is all you need. To press a figure out of the specific meanings is an example of what they call, what Paul calls lagomachia, striving with words or hair splitting. He, I don't think Paul had that in mind at all. In 1 Timothy 6.4, the word refers to quibbling over words, so here it probably refers to verbal disputes that distract from the close attention that should be given to the word. Truth. Truth highlights the contrast between God's unshakable special revelation and the worthless chatter of novelty seekers. There is a correlation between the quantity of our detailed analysis of scripture and maintaining doctrinal orthodoxy. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the command is instilling in Timothy, Tim and Timothy's mind, the importance of precision. Learning the general idea of what Scripture teaches is not enough because it gives the novelty teachers too much room to roam in search of their innovations. It allows them to shade the truth a little this way or that way to integrate the Bible with psychology or science, philosophy, anthropology, sociology, mathematics, modern linguistics, or some other secular discipline that allegedly has come up with additional truth from God's general revelation. Our handling of Scripture has to be right. It has to be accurate. It has to be right on target. If you have been near a Christian institution of higher learning in recent years, you have heard the expression, all truth is God's truth. There's no chapter and verse for that, friends. We may not have a, a we don't have a session to deal with that during our time together. But uh, that essentially equates general revelation with special revelation and results in a distortion of general, of special revelation, rather. Now, Dr. Dean has suggested topics for me to cover in the three sessions we are together. General cons considerations about biblical hermeneutics, that's this morning. The principle of single meaning, that's tomorrow. And the hermeneutical principles in the Gospels, that will be Wednesday. And uh, thankfully, uh, as I was trying to decide how to spend, how to shorten my remarks on Wednesday, I came up with an extra session, so you'll have to put up with me all morning on Wednesday. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Undoubtedly, certain matters of consideration will overlap. 
from one session to another, but I'll try to keep them separate. I expect to encounter differences of opinion among you, and uh, I welcome those. You see, I'm a young man. I'm still learning, <laughs> and uh, I learn from your questions and discussions, so please don't disappoint me in our times of, of interaction after each message. I welcome your questions and your observations because that's the way I learn, and I came to learn. The first thing that we have to do today is discover the role of hermeneutics in relation to other subjects in the theological curriculum. And I found it helpful to use a chart to do this. And uh, you can read it, our whole chart. The type is kind of small. In some places, if we need to, we can zero in on, on parts of it. But uh, notice at level one, you have three disciplines. The discipline of biblical introduction, the discipline of hermeneutics, and the discipline of biblical language. That is the foundation for our interpreting the Bible. The foundation for exegesis, which becomes the foundation for level three and level four. Our ultimate goal is Bible exposition. We want to be able to preach the whole counsel of God and to do it accurately. And in order to do so, we have to start off right at level one. And uh, biblical introduction includes the matters of deciding which text is the correct text, the, the sometimes called textual criticism. It includes areas of the canon. What are the books of the New Testament that we are working on, or what are the books of the Old Testament that we are working with? And it includes matters of historical background that is uh, indispensable in the area of grammatical historical interpretation. But it also includes the biblical languages. And uh, we have tried to insist through the years in all of our relationships of in stressing the importance that our men learn the biblical languages. That's the painful part of seminary training. And uh, it's, but it is an indispensable part because we believe the text is inspired in the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And uh, in order to deal with God's inspired text, we have to get to those languages. If we are limiting ourselves to translations, then we have sacrifices that have to, make, have to be made. I was glad to hear Dr. Martin say a few minutes ago of Schaefer Seminary's emphasis on the biblical languages. And these three feed into the area of biblical exegesis, which is the actual interpretation. Level three is all er these are all areas of application of what we learn from the text, whether it's systematic theology, biblical theology, church history, historical theology, philosophy of religion, apologetics, homiletics, counseling, Christian ed, administration, admissions, uh, rather missions, evangelism, the contemporary society that we live in, all of those are areas of application. And of course, feeding into, uh, all of these feed into the exposition of God's word, which is what those of you and those of us who give forth the word in local churches are commissioned to do give it accurately, and to give it uh, with all of the various ramifications that it has theologically and practically in Christian ministry. Um, so using that as our background, I would like to go first to, to clarify some definitions that have arisen. Um, with the traditional grammatical historical approach to exegesis, the three areas of study that constitute the foundation to obtaining the meaning of a biblical text is uh, 
what we are looking at as a foundation. At this point, we must inject a parenthesis, however, because the definitions of our terms have undergone traditional change. And um, my advice to you, if you want to start a new heresy, the first thing you need to do is to change definitions of the traditional words. And we have had an abundance of that in evangelicalism just in our day of time, in our day and time. I've given four examples here. First, the meaning of her hermeneutics. We've had four different definitions of that in recent evangelical literature. It is a philosophical and linguistic mindset. It is a set of principles. It is an interpretive use of those principles. It is an application of the resulting interpretation to contemporary situations. <coughs> Four definitions of hermeneutics. The meaning of exegesis. We've got four of those. Exegesis is an implementation of valid interpretive principles. It is an aspect of hermeneutics. It is an implementation of valid interpretive principles plus a subjective sensitivity to additional divinely intended meetings or it is an application of the results of interpretation to the contemporary situations. Take your choice. It is worthy to note that A and D under Meanings it corresponds to C and D under hermeneutics. Number three, the meaning of uh, the meaning of meaning includes seven possibilities. It is a referent, that is what the text is talking about, a sense, that is what is being said about the referent. It is an intention, the truth intention of the author. It is a significance, that's the contemporary application. It is a value, an expression of preference and priority. It is an entailment, a related consequence associated with biblical words. Or it is a connotation of the text as an entity independent of its source and its readership. Seven different meanings for meaning. You take your choice. And then, oh, excuse me, number eight, I missed it. The signification of the text, that's number eight. And then, fourthly, what is, what does interpre what is interpretation? It is an understanding of the authorial intention, an understanding of the authorial intention and present-day relevance. It is an understanding of the present-day relevance and a practical compliance with the contemporary application. Now to one such as myself who thought I knew what these four means, terms meant, the proliferation of ramifications now attached to them is absolutely bewildering. As a practicing, practicing exegete, I thought that hermeneutics was the same as 1B, a set of principles. Exegesis was the same as 2A an ap implementation of valid pr interpretive principles. That number three, the m meaning was the understanding of the authorial intention. That's, and then number four, the interpretation is an understanding of the... the uh, I've got that... The, well, the meaning is the truth intention, and then the interpretation is a valid understanding of the authorial intention. Now, I'm happy to be in harmony with Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary and my understanding of each of these terms, but I discover that the current hermeneutical literature of, of the all three uh, has bewildering additional meanings to each one. Now, no one intentionally created this state of confusion, but it is a shame that the propounders of new hermeneutical principles did not utilize old terms for their new meanings instead of using new terms for different, with different meanings. It is almost as if there is an unconscious desire to retain a continuity with the, from the, with the past where little continuity actually exists. So they don't want to cut off the past completely, but at the same time, they've got, they're coming up with something brand new. 
This practice of assigning new meanings to old words has resulted in a lot of uncertainty in communication among evangelicals. And uh, we have to wonder what contributes to this confusion. Final answers to that question are evasive, but my proposal is that confusion in defining common hermeneutical terms has arisen at least in part from different hermeneutical principles that have come into play among evangelicals in recent years. Now, for clarity's sake, we have set forth the four definitions that we have accepted. Hermeneutics is a set of principles. Exegesis is an implementation of valid interpretable principles. Meaning is the truth intention of the author. Interpretation is an understanding of the truth intention of the author. So I will be using those traditional terms in the traditional senses. Now, the foundational nature of hermeneutics uh, the chart that we have displayed for you shows the foundational nature. It is traditionally referred to as the grammatical historical method or the historical grammatical principles. The grammar requires a knowledge of the principle of biblical languages. The history necessitates an awareness of the facts of history Obviously, to utilize the principles of hermeneutics, a person must have a working knowledge of the original languages. He must know what books belong in the canon and must establish the exact text of the autographs of the book of the Bible, that is, as they came from the hands of the original authors. And he gets help from biblical introduction in this area known the area known as general introduction as well as special introduction even how even here however we're living in a day of confusion because the practice of exegesis at level 2 in the theological curriculum uh, suffers because of some errant errant uh, understandings at level 1 Traditional grammatical principles have come under assault by a new discipline that has only been with us among evangelicals and actually even in the secular world since about 1960. I think it was in the 1960 that uh, UCLA even began its graduate program in modern linguistics, so it's a relatively new field. Uh, and uh, modern linguistics essentially even among evangelicals, second guesses a lot of our grammatical principles. Uh, Daniel Wallace's well-known Greek grammar, Beyond the Basics, is full of the influence of modern linguistics. It is not really Greek grammar. It is modern linguistics in many, many cases. A typical example is that uh, his... Uh, his use of what he calls the plenary genitive, which uh, one of our students quizzed him on this. He claimed he got that expression from, uh, I think it was Charles Ryrie, which is a lot of who he, he didn't get it from Charles Ryrie, that the genitive in certain instances can have multiple meanings is completely contrary to uh, her hermeneutics as well as uh, a basic Greek grammar. And then the English word historical has taken on several meanings too. It can either be history as a record of actual happenings simultaneous with the chronology of the narrative or history as interpreted by later chronological generations. Or it can be uh, a developing narrative or De developing understanding as understood by later generations. So grammatical historical principles have traditionally looked upon history as a record of actual happening simultaneous with the chronology of the biblical narrative. But some evangelicals are veering away from that meaning of history. 
and taking the dynamic concept of history and progressive dispensationalism is a prime example of that with their complementary hermeneutics. They have distorted the traditional meaning of, herme of history in order to comply with their system. In light of such deviations from traditional definitions of various terms, when one speaks in of following grammatical historical principles of interpretation, he must be careful to define his terms carefully. We've got many people who are using grammatical historical as descriptive of their hermeneutics right now, but they aren't doing any such thing. Uh, they are using grammatical, historical, linguistic, or grammatical, historical, philosophical, or grammatical, historic, theological. Anytime you add a third, mean, a third member to that, you have distorted the grammatical historical. And um, maybe you want to argue with me on that, but I have become fully convinced that that is true. Otherwise, hermeneutical principles may be indistinguishable from those used by the new evangelical hermeneutics. Now, looking at our chart, what are the recent additions to the foundation of the level one on our chart? Evangelical hermeneutics as now practiced in many and probably most evangelical environments takes on a different complexion from the traditional evangelical model. Level one in the schema of relationships that we have shown you has a new member. And uh, that new member, as you will recognize, is the pre-understanding that has been added to level one. That never was a part of evangelical hermeneutics traditionally, but now it is looked upon as an indispensable part. A student at another seminary sat in my office last week and uh, describing the hermeneutics he had been given at his seminary, which is in our neighborhood in California, and uh, he had been given the pre-understanding as a, the place where you start with hermeneutics. And uh, it's been a good time. I gave him a good book to read. I hope he's reading it now. But uh, from, we see, from the schema, we see that the new resident at level one is pre-understanding. Definitions of pre-understanding vary widely. This is probably the most conspicuous difference in practice of biblical interpretation. It has been the rise to prominence of pre-understanding, which is, has at one time or another been classified as hermeneutical self-awareness. Hermeneutical self-awareness. Most consider this addition to the arena of hermeneutical guidelines to be an absolute necessity and a healthy development. If you have the uh, CD, you will find documentation for uh, much of what we have from this point on. The special attention devoted to the interpreter is ultimately the result of the Kantian emphasis on subjectivity or subjective reality as distinct from objective reality. With many, Pre-understanding is the principal determiner of one's eventual understanding of Scripture. With others, it is possible to overcome pre-understanding partially and to approximate the text objective meaning to some degree. But with almost all, if not all, pre-understanding is a starting point for hermeneutics, as a starting point for hermeneutics, is here to stay. What is pre-understanding then? For Silva, it is another name for prejudice or a commitment to the traditional view of inspiration. But it includes such things as a dispensational theology, for example. Another definition cited is hermeneutical self-awareness by which Osborne includes the impact of church history 
contemporary meanings of word symbols, personal experiences, one's confessional tradition, and rational thinking. McCartney and Clayton use presupposition to speak of the same thing as pre-understanding and define them as one's views regarding life and ultimate realities about the nature of the text being studied. Klein, Blumberg, and Hubbard follow Ferguson, defining pre-understanding as a body of assumptions and attitudes which a person brings to the perception and interpretation of reality or any aspect of it. They distinguish these from presuppositions, including in the latter such thing as the inspiration of the Bible, its authoritativeness and truthfulness, its spiritual worth and effectiveness, its unity and diversity, its clarity, and a fixed canon of 66 books. How this differs from pre-understanding is difficult to decipher, especially in light of their use of the same point, one's view of the miraculous as an illustration of both pre-understanding and presuppositions. Johnson, this is Elliot Johnson, lists five hermeneutical premises, which he apparently equates with pre-understanding, the literal, the grammatical, the historical, the textual design, and the theological. Mulquelkin's aim for pre-understanding is presuppositions. He gives the following. As a supernatural book, the Bible is authoritative and trustworthy. As a natural book, it, is, it uses human communication. Tate refers to pre-understanding as the interpreter's present horizon of understanding, that is, colored lenses through which the reader views the text. He seems to distinguish pre-understanding, at least to some extent, from presuppositions, which he classifies as reader presuppositions and theological presuppositions. Uncertainty among hermeneutical theoreticians regarding what constitutes pre-understanding is widespread and multiple and results in multiple pre-understandings of pre-understanding. <laughs> they agree only regarding its influence on the outcome of the interpretive endeavor. In line with this acknowledged subjectivism, most advocate that one must view his own conclusions as tentative. That fits with postmodernism. This, this relativism e leads easily to divesting the scripture of any value in stating propositional truth. Those one, the, the one writer would limit the uncertainty to ambiguous areas such as sovereignty and responsibility, the millennial, millennial issue, and church government. Others pass off this uncertainty as tolerance of fellow believers for the sake of unity that is, I don't agree with your conclusions, but I concede your interpretation. If allowed to progress to its logical end, however, this outlook may lead eventually to a realization that what we have considered to be cardinal dogmas, such as the de deity of Christ, his second coming, and his substitutionary atonement are merely myopic conclusions of Western white middle class male interpretations. Such a hermeneutical approach would spell the end of meaningful Christian doctrine. Now the reasons why the current foundation is shaky. The new and primary role given to pre-understanding in the exegetical process conflicts sharply with the traditional grammatical historical principles. It injects the subjective elements into interpretation that have been purposely and consciously shunned in quests for the meaning of scripture until the emergence of new, evangel new hermeneutical principles among evangelicals since the 1970s and 1980s. Some of you were alive then. Those who studied hermeneutics in many, if not most, evangelical colleges and seminaries during the 1950s and have learned the importance of seeking objectivity in interpretation, as I did, letting the text speak for itself without imposing personal biases on what the text's meaning might be. Ram said it this way, the true philological spirit or critical spirit 
or scholarly spirit in biblical interpretation has as its goal to discover the original meaning and intention of the text. Its goal is exegesis, to lead the meaning out of the text and sons isodesis, bringing the meaning to the text. Continuing with Ram, it is very difficult for any person to approach the Holy Scriptures free from prejudices and assumptions which distort the text. The, rain, the danger of having a set theological system is that in the interpretation of Scripture, the system tends to govern the interpretation rather than the interpretation correcting the system. <coughs> Continuing with, with Ram one more time, Calvin said that the Holy Scripture is not a tennis ball that we may bounce around at will, Rather, it is the word of God whose teachings must be learned by the most impartial and objective study of the text. Blessings on you, John Calvin. Before the hermeneutical revelation that began among evangelicals in the 1970s and 1980s, objectivity was of the highest priority. Beginning study of a text with a conscious pre-understanding of what it sh would yield was unthought of, as Ram emphatically states before he ever conceived that evangelicals would advocate letting subjective considerations become a part of interpretation. He allows that such occurred with non-evangelicals such as Boltmann and Tillich, but insisted that it might not happen among those of evangelical persuasions. But the sad fact is that both Maughan and Tillich have spilled over into evangelical in flood proportions. Terry supports the same quest for objectivity. Now, I, and, uh, I'm using Ram and Terry for convenience sake. We could go back to the Reformation. We could go back to the Princeton theologians in the 19th century. We could go back, as far as I'm concerned, we could go back to the Garden of Eden, but of course... Simple, simplicity stake, we uh, let me our sources here. Terry reproduced a book on biblical hermeneutics in the late uh, 19th century that was agreed by, upon by all evangelicals for the first half of the 20th century as the standard in biblical hermeneutics. Unfortunately, before he did the third work in his trilogy, Terry himself went sour. He, he was a Methodist, and he was traveling in that environment that, unfortunately, he said some things in the, his book on apo apocalypticism, the third member of the trilogy that he would never have said. And he even violates his own principles in the last book, half of the hermeneutics book. But by and large, it has been agreed that his hermeneutical principles were the guideline for evangelicalism who believed in an in inerrant text. Now, here's what Terry says. The objectionable feature of these methods, that is, the apologetic and dogmatic methods, is that they virtually set out with the ostensible purpose of maintaining a preconceived hypothesis. The hypothesis may be right, but the procedure is always liable to mislead. It presents the constant temptation to find desired meanings in words and ignore the scope and general purpose of the writer. There are cases where it is well to assume a hypothesis and use it as a means of investigation, but in all such cases, the hypothesis only to assumed tentatively, not affirmed dogmatically. In the exposition of the Bible, apology and dogma have a legitimate place. The true apology defends the sacred books against an unreasonable and captious criticism and presents their claims to be regarded as the revelation of God. But this can be done only by pursuing rational methods and by use of a convincing logic. So also scriptures are profitable for dogma, but the dogma must be shown to be a legitimate teaching of scripture, not a traditional teaching of scripture. For time's sake, I'm going to leave off the rest of the, his quotation, and you have it on the CD that you 
came came with. We'll go on uh, beyond that. In his classic work on hermeneutics, Terry insisted on letting the text speak for itself without allowing ideas foreign to the text to intervene in its interpretation. Though he lived long before the notion of beginning the exegetical process with a pre-understanding of what it was going to say had made its appearance among the conservatives, he clearly thought to obtain a, an objective awareness of what the biblical writers intended when they penned the words of Scripture. The only assumption he made was unavoidable. He was dealing with an inspired book, not an uninspired book. That has always been the goal of grammatical interpretation until the recent changeover in hermeneutics, hermeneutical principles among some evangelicals. The method consciously seeks to rule out any, purchase, any personal biases and predispositions in order to let the rules of grammar and the facts of history of each text speak for itself. The quest for objectivity has allowed the Bible to yield propositional truths that constitute a sure foundation for evangelical Christianity. This present state of affairs among evangelicals is a far cry from the certainty intended for God's people. He gave revelations to Paul and others that we might know the things freely given to us by God not that we might tentatively theorize what the God has given us. Exegesis is not an exercise designed to correct my pre-understanding as the hermeneutical circle or spiral approaches contend. It is rather a scientific exercise designed to allow the text to speak for itself. Now, often I hear the objection, impossible, impossible. A person cannot divest himself of his pre-understanding in handling Scripture. Every person is biased, they say. He should recognize his own bias and let the text correct it. He should continue going back and forth between a corrected pre-understanding and the text of an, a number of times, each time getting closer to what the text means. Note the frequent frequency with which evangelicals refer to the hermeneutical circle or the hermeneutical spiral. I propose that the interpreter should begin with a tabla rasa, as the reformers called it, a clean slate, and let the text speak for itself. Again, I hear the protest impossible. The following analogy may help portray what an approach to hermeneutics should be. Our quest for objectivity in interpretation resembles our quest for Christian sanctification. The Rather than expending all our energies explaining why we cannot attain absolute holiness, 1 Peter 1.16, you shall be holy for I am holy. The fact that we cannot attain absolute holiness does mean, not mean that we take our sights off the target of being holy as he is holy. The fact that we cannot obtain in this life unblemished holiness does not excuse us from continuing to pursue it without becoming preoccupied with reasons why we must fail. So it is in hermeneutics and exegesis. Our goal is to correctly interpret the word of truth, remember? Our goal is the objective meaning of Scripture. Let us not be distracted from pursuing it. It is within the capability of the spirit-illumined believer to arrive at objective meaning, that is the meaning God intended to transmit through human authors. This is possible not because we are so expert in our interpretation, but because God is an expert communicator. He is an expert communicator in his word. A failure to have objectivity as a goal is just as serious as a failure to have Christian sanctification. 
as a goal because of the lesson we learned from 2 Timothy 2.15. If Paul taught that lesson to Timothy in his study of Scripture, it is certainly a lesson for us. There is enough objectivity in using traditional grammatical historical principles to enable us to do away with the circle and the spiral. Now the source of pre-understandings. With the variety of pre-understandings of pre-understanding, <laughs> settling a single source or even a specific number of sources for pre-understanding is uh, as varied as there are individuals almost. Probably it is as varied as there are individuals. Such a person's pre-understanding will differ from the next person. Yet the probability is high that most pre-understandings draw from the disciplines of level three and four in our section. Either it makes good preaching to handle the text this way, it fits my homiletical outline beautifully, or it makes good theology, I've got my own hobby horse that I'm going to pursue, so I'll find that in this text, or it uh, interpreting history, I like this particular individual in history, so I'll follow his heresy. <laughs> or uh, a matter of, of uh, missions, we have a whole lot of false philosophies of mission in our day that are pursuing the, the uh, the people movements and all that kind of stuff, Donald McGavern and and his associates that uh, have set us off on the wrong foot. And a lot of mission societies have bought into the wrong philosophy of missions that is not exegetically based. Now, uh, for someone to come to a text with the pre-understanding that the only place in the Bible that gives the pure gospel if John 647 and uh, the idea that there is a minimum content of necessary information at that particular at that particular verse as I've understood in recent reading uh, even just in the last week or so such a sequence of exegetical study will lead inevitably to a wrong understanding of the text meaning the basic problem is the whole discussion of a crossless gospel, as it has been called by some, is being carried on at level three instead of at level one where it should be. For an example, if uh, those who talk about John 647 as containing a sufficient gospel, they neglect John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as, rest of the, as well as the rest of the New Testament in holding that particular position. Uh, as suggested earlier in this discussion by Moses Silver, dispensationalism is another level three discipline. And uh, that, that pre-understanding can throw us off too. I am a dispensationalist, <laughs> but more basically, I like to think of myself as a grammatical historical exegete. And uh, there's only one direction that being a grammatical historical exegete can lead you, but I don't start with that pre-understanding when I look at the text of Scripture. I don't start with a dispensational understanding. I look at it from the standpoint of the grammar and the history. And uh, wherever that leads me, that'll be fine. You know, I've never graduated from being a New Testament exegete to the level of being a systematic theologian. I'm just not smart enough. <laughs> I would rather stay a New Testament exegete the rest of my life. And uh, whatever that leads me, I, w I want to go. And uh, thankfully, of course, I love fellowship with other dispensationalists, but I don't want to let that affect my interpretation of Scripture. That is a hindrance to God speaking to me through his word. I need to look at the grammar. I need to look at the history. That's it. If 
find out what it says. If that doesn't fit dispensationalism in that particular passage, let's uh, let's be honest. If it uh, if I should become a covenant theologian and begin to interpret the text in light of my covenant theology, that would be an abuse. Any time you bring something at level three down to level one, you, in my estimation, have violated the meaning of that God intended for us to understand. Contemporary society is another level three category. This issue of global warming. Should I interpret the text in light of the global warming? <laughs> in the realm of historical theology, another level creek category. At a recent point in church history, the practice of historical criticism became prominent even among evangelicals. That came in about the 1970s when it first showed its faith. Well, the early 1960s, actually, but uh, it came to full bloom in the 1970s. We'll talk more about that on Wednesday, the Lord willing. Any pet subject, theological or otherwise, can become a pre-understanding at level one. It can affect our understanding of the Bible, and we don't want that. And uh, the above, the suggestions I made taking a discipline that rightly belongs at level three and or level four and inserting it at level one as a pre-understanding and throwing the whole exegetical process out of whack is an abuse. There are endless numbers of these pre-understandings that have been perpetrated on us. Uh, just a brief word about the principles of gram grammatical historical hermeneutics that are being most often undermined, and this could be expanded by the new evangelical hermeneutics. Uh, one is the cultural uniqueness of the biblical text. There is something special about the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text of Scripture that cannot be mimicked in any other language or in any other historical environment. The uniqueness and superiority of special revelation. Special revelation always deserves preference over general revelation, but it's not being done that way. The principle of single meaning. The single meaning intended by the author and understood by the immediate reading, readers has dominant control over any practical application. Lord willing, we'll do with that tomorrow. Distinction between interpretation and application. Application is completely distinct from interpretation, but it is controlled by correct interpretation. The certainty resting on the biblical text, scripture given that we may know, not that we may question what is correct. The sufficiency of grammatical historical principles without a addition of literary or uh, rhetorical or philosophical or anything else. The pers perspicuity of the biblical text. The Bible does not use some secret coded principles to yield its correct meaning as some new systems are saying these days. The historical accuracy of the biblical text. Uh, we believe that the Bible leave, yields lit, literal, uh, accurate facts of history. The literal understanding of a text, unless the context of the passage suggests a non-literal approach. And uh, finally, the inerrancy of the text, which should be a an integral part of or for biblical hermeneutics. Now just to illustrate where we are going as evangelicals, there are recent emerging what I call bogus systems. Five that we have enumerated in the, the book on evangelical hermeneutics, progressive dispensationalism, evangelical feminism, evangelical missiology, theonomy, and open theism. 
The list is growing at a rapid rate even as I speak. Within roads of pre-understanding at level road, level one in theological study, the rate is bound to increase. Since the book was print, printed, I think in 19, 2002, I think it was, we have already seen such things as the new perspective on Paul, the emerging or emergent church, whatever you want to call it, new covenant theology, it's pretty new, the non-cessationist movement, non-cessationists never had a hermeneutic for a hundred years, but now with the evangelical hermeneutics, <laughs> they do have a hermeneutic. Uh, two new isms that are still not on the front page, the speech act theory and intertextuality. All of this has happened since the incorporation of new evangelical hermeneutics in the 1970s and early 1980s. When examined closely, each of these has its own pre-understanding that throws the exegetical process all out of whack. In our limited time together, we would like to touch on as many of these as we can. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Uh, do you want to circulate with these microphones as these folk have questions or comments? That's right. Okay, anybody have any questions? We have a short time here, but we'll take a couple of questions. Gordon. No, I noticed that uh, Hank Hanegraaff came up with a new system of hermeneutics, and I wondered if you'd looked into that at all yet. It, I am not an expert on Hank Hanegram, but uh, I know enough to know that he has a semblance of impressive hermeneutics, but he is uh, pretty shallow and has distorted things with his pre-understanding in regard to eschatology. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a book on it. <laughs> It's kind of breaking the apocalypse code where we analyzed his hermeneutic. Good. Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I can use all the help I can get. <laughs> Mike. Um, you briefly commented on uh, Wallace's use of the genitive, and I was wondering if you could also comment on the uh, new, I don't want to say definition, but the new use of the aorist and how you feel about that. The new what now? Use of the aorist. Uh, well, that's not really too new. You're talking about verbal aspect? Yeah, um, more of, you know, 95% of the time I view it as some kind of past tense, you know, just action in the past of some form or fashion. Oh, you're talking about Stan Porter. Yeah, this this new idea of the aorist is undefined. It has no aspect of time to it, with well, excluding the subjunctive aorist. Well, that's his approach to verbal aspect, and I, I don't think he has any basis for it. I have not seen it. Dr. Osborne, one of our faculty who taught the classics for 19 years before he came to us, classical scholars have never heard of that. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think it's uh, anything to it, really. Uh, since you brought up uh, like the use of the planetary, planetary genitive and was saying that um, I, he has that all wrong, now, do you think that um, he that's coming out of pre-understanding, or he just has it wrong? And how do you know? How do you tell when it's coming I think, out? I think his, his pre-understanding is that modern linguistics has uh, uh, corrected traditional grammatical principles, and uh, that uh, the church was wrong for 19, 20, 2,000 years in regard to the grammar they were using okay. to understand New Testament. Uh, the modern linguistics is a a very subtle distortion, and it comes on as uh, none, none of them has explained how the church has remained orthodox through these years with its wrong understanding of grammar. So I, I, it's a, a matter that you, and, they, and by the way, modern in, linguistics is still tentative. They're developing. They don't agree with, they all talk about discourse analysis, yet I have not seen a consensus definition of discourse analysis yet. 
So um, when you when it's still developing like that, they shouldn't be coming on with dogmatic statements like that. That's Robbie and me having a discussion at Taco Bell. At where? Taco Bell. Oh, Taco Bell. Okay. Discor discourse analysis. Okay. <laughs> well, an another part of the problem is the influence of postmodernism today on linguistic theory is is profound. And so one of the things that comes out with the plenary genitive is the idea that a, a, a genitive can be both a subjective genitive and an objective genitive at the same time. So that it can mean, for example, a phrase like love of God can mean both love for God and love from God equally and at the same time. Well, that means basically what you're saying is the phrase can mean anything. So that that is more very much akin to and influenced by the, the postmodernism in in linguistics. So uh, it go, that goes to single meaning of the text, which is what Dr. Thomas will address uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, let's take our Bible.